Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one where we know what happened, but we still have so, so many questions about this case and we really have no idea why. We can speculate, but we don't really have all of the answers. It's a very interesting case, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think about it after hearing the details. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Native for partnering with me on today's video. Those of you who have been watching my channel for some time now know just how much I love working with Native, and that's because I love all of their products, especially their body washes. When I look for a body wash, I look for something that has simple, clean ingredients that'll give me a nice, fresh scent. I love Native Body Washes for those exact reasons. Native Body Wash gives you a luxurious, foamy lather without using any sulfated surfactants. Their body washes are also folate and dye-free, it's vegan and cruelty-free, and it's made with plant-based cleansers. Plus, it's made with citric acid for pH balance to keep your skin fresh and happy. I love that their body washes leave me feeling fresh and clean without any residue, leaving my skin feeling silky and smooth. The other great thing that I absolutely love about Native is their huge variety of scent choices with new scents being released all of the time. They literally have so many different scents and just when you think you've tried them all, they come out with even more scents all of the time. I personally have Coastal Oak and Amber. This one feels like a nice classic scent that anybody would love. It's fresh and soapy and has a nice outdoorsy, woodsy undertone scent along with it. I also have Sweet Peach and Nectar, which is another amazing soapy sweet smell, but it's not overwhelmingly fruity or sweet. It has the perfect balance of fresh, sweet, and soapy, in my opinion. Then I have my absolute favorite scent. This is my classic. This is one that I use almost on a daily basis, Lilac and White Tea. I'm literally in love with this scent. This one is subtle and fresh with still having that amazing floral sweet smell that I absolutely love. Right now, Native has a special offer for my subscribers. You can get 20% off of your first purchase at Native when you use my link down below and use code RACHELSHANNON15. This offer is available site-wide, but only for a limited time, so make sure you stock up and save. Again, the code is RACHELSHANNON15 or use my link down below for 20% off of your Native products site-wide. Thank you again so much to Native for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's just get into today's case. Mason Wayne Sisk was born to his father, John Sisk, and his mother, who I do not think we know the name of at this time. John earned his associate's degree in diesel mechanics from Lincoln Tech in Indianapolis and then went on to work as a car repairman for a dealership in Huntsville, Alabama, where they were living at the time. He had also gone to the Paul Mitchell School in Huntsville, where he earned his cosmetology license and went on to work in that field with cutting and styling hair. Now, John did have a little bit of a criminal record, including burglary and breaking and entering, but even though he had a rough past, friends described that John was trying to do whatever he could to be a better person. He was focusing on spirituality and devoting his life to his family. Friends said that he had a bigger-than-life personality. They said he was outgoing and enjoyed riding motorcycles. He was also somebody who would bend over backwards to help a friend whenever they needed it. In the early 2000s, John had been married to a woman who was the mother of Mason. However, by 2008, when Mason was only three years old, John and his ex-wife split ways. John would later say that his first wife was an alcoholic who regularly did hard drugs. He told the courts that there were police records of her being called on multiple times for being drunk or under the influence of drugs when she was supposed to be helping take care of Mason. He said that she was not fit to be a mother or take care of Mason, so he went to the courts by 2010 to fight for full custody of Mason, and he was granted full custody of him by the time Mason was five years old. And by 2011, Mason's biological mother actually passed away at the age of 31 years old. And I don't think we actually know what she passed away from, but she was very young and we know that she had problems with drugs. So it could be related to that. 
Could not be. We don't truly really know. After that, John went on to get remarried to another woman named Mary. Mary had attended Southeastern Louisiana University, where she earned her bachelor's and master's degree. She then worked as a special education teacher for over 10 years. She was very proud of her work, where she worked with children of all walks of life. At the time of her death, she worked in the seventh grade with the special education department at the school. The couple went on to have three more children of their own, two sons and one daughter, six-year-old Grayson, five-year-old Aurora, and six-month-old Colson. For all that Mason knew, it seemed that he had a relatively normal childhood, something we will discuss more later in the video, but throughout his entire life, he had no idea that his biological mother had passed away. That entire time, he thought that Mary was his mother. He didn't know that his siblings were his half-siblings and that Mary was not biologically related to him. John could never find the strength to break this information to Mason. Now, the weekend of Labor Day in 2019 started as a pretty exciting weekend. Mason's uncle, who they called Uncle Gator, whose real name was John, and his wife, who they just referred to as Aunt Angela, they invited the Sisk family over to their home in Gulf Breeze, Florida to spend the weekend with them for Labor Day. John was really excited to go over there because he had always wanted to live in Florida. So, the family of six all went over to Uncle Gator's house for the weekend. While there, Uncle Gator would later say that John was abnormally quiet, Aunt Angela noticed that there was a little bit of tension in the air when the family was visiting, this sort of struck them as odd because nobody seemed to be acting themselves, but it wasn't enough for them to really say anything about it to anybody. After their weekend on the drive back, Mason said that he was listening to music in his earbuds, but he could tell again that there was tension, that the family was fighting a little bit. He said that when they finally got home, he went into the basement to play video games. He put his earphones in because he could hear noises upstairs that were annoying him. He said that he stayed downstairs and played the game Need for Speed while Mary went to bed early because she had to be up at 4 a.m. the following day. However, by 11 p.m. on Tuesday, September 2nd, 2019, 911 received a call from 14-year-old Mason to report that he believed that his family had all died. In that 911 call, he told the operator that he was freaking out and needed help. He said that he heard five gunshots go off in his home. He said that he was in the basement playing video games when that happened, so he went upstairs to see what happened, and he found that his mom, dad, and all three siblings had been shot. He said that he immediately ran out of the house, got into his mom's car, and drove to the end of the driveway before he called 911 and waited for the deputies to arrive. When the first officer arrived, he found that Mason was still sitting in his mom's car. The officer went up to Mason and asked him who was inside, and he told him that his family was inside. Then the officer asked him if the offender or the shooter was gone, and he said yes. He told the officers that he thought he saw a Chevy drive off as he was running outside, but he couldn't be sure if it was a car or a truck. Immediately, the two officers on scene patted Mason down, placed him in handcuffs before putting him in the back of their patrol car. They told Mason that he was being detained for now while they went inside and tried to figure out what was going on. So, they sat Mason in the back of the police car with some officers checking in on him regularly and the other officers going inside and checking out the scene. When police entered the home, they found that there was no apparent signs of a struggle, no signs of a break-in. So, they went into each bedroom of the home and that is where they found each member of the family. Police found that six-year-old Grayson and five-year-old Aurora were each in their beds dead after suffering from gunshot wounds. Then they found that both John and Mary were also in their beds with their six-month-old baby Colson lying between them. The three of them had also been shot to death. Their bodies were later sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. They found that John, Grayson, and Aurora had each died from a single gunshot wound to their heads, while Grayson had two shots to his head and Mary had one shot to her head and one shot to her torso. They found that Grayson had gunsa in one of the wounds, so that meant that he was shot from less than one foot away. 
then the other victims had signs of stippling, which meant that they were each shot from less than three feet away. All that to say that each member of the family appears to have been shot in their sleep, in their beds, all at close range but they weren't able to determine, you know, exactly how close they were shot from. After about an hour of sitting in the police car, Mason was then taken into the police station for further questioning. According to some responding officers, they just had a bad feeling about Mason and felt that he wasn't giving them the full story. They said that he was either extremely traumatized or he was acting very strangely. His story seemed a little bit spotty and there were certain details that he seemed to be keeping from them. So they questioned him further. First, before the official questioning started, they asked Mason to look at his phone, which he did allow them to. They found that Mason called his girlfriend four times before he called 911. And they found that he didn't even call 911 on his own phone. He used his dad's phone. He was asked about this and Mason said that he really didn't know what to do when he first found his family dead. In the station, the police really started to push Mason. They started asking him different questions about what happened that night. And it seemed that the more Mason spoke, the more his story began to change. He first said that he knew his family was dead because he saw them. He told the officers that after hearing those five shots, he ran upstairs to the bedrooms, but as he was running up the stairs, he stumbled on the fifth step, so that kind of delayed him from getting upstairs. Then, as he was going up to see what was happening, he heard footsteps before he heard someone leave out of the front door. He said that he went to his parents' bedrooms and saw blood on their faces. So, he ran out to the front door, and that is when he saw taillights leaving out of the driveway. But then he started to change his story. In the second version, he said that he didn't actually see his parents. This time, he said that he heard the shots coming from upstairs while he was in the basement, but he didn't go to his parents' or siblings' rooms to check on them. He just went straight out and called 911 to report that his family was dead, again, without ever seeing them. The police officer responded, how did you know they were killed? And he said, it was just an assumption. The officer responded, you knew all five had been killed without going back to check on them? And he said, yeah, which again made absolutely no sense. If you are downstairs or in a different room and you hear all of these shots being fired, you have no idea what the situation is. You don't know if only your parents are killed. You don't know if your parents just killed the other siblings. You have no idea what's going on. So... That was very strange to the police officers that he said that he just sort of assumed that everybody was dead. Then officers told Mason that it was very strange that he wouldn't think to immediately call 911 before calling his girlfriend. Because again, he said that he didn't know what to do after finding his family dead, but most people, the first thing that they would think to do is to call 911. So, fast forwarding a little bit in this case, the officers did end up speaking with Mason's girlfriend, Lola Holiday. Lola said that on that night, Mason called her asking if he could come over to her house in Huntsville, but she told him that she wasn't home. She was out visiting a friend in a different town. She said that he was crying and was hysterical, telling her that the family was all dead. She said that he told her that he heard the gunshots, went upstairs to see what was going on, and saw the taillights leaving the driveway. He said that he wanted to go to her house because he didn't want to stay in the home with his family who had just been shot. Lola said that she told Mason not to leave because then the cops would think that he's the one who did it. She instructed him to call the police, so that is what he did. She also said that her mom told her to tell Mason to get into the car and park at the end of the driveway so that he didn't have to be in that house with his family members. That is what Lola remembered about that night, so that also sort of explains why Mason chose to leave the house and was at the end of the driveway. It's because Lola's mother told him to do that. So, now going back to the night of the interrogation. After he was taken into the station for questioning, they started asking him questions about if he had family issues at home. They said that it was only a matter of time before they find the gun that was used in the killings and would connect it to who was responsible. Throughout the entire interview, Mason had his head down and he was picking at his skin and he spoke in a low tone. 
He repeatedly said, I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't kill my parents. I didn't kill my brother and sister. But the police urged him once again to just tell them the truth. And after several hours of interrogation, Mason sighed and started to whisper. He said, I got fed up with it. The kids went through a lot. All the arguing, dad walking out. Yeah, I killed them. He was asked whether he intended to just kill his parents and he said no, he intended to kill all of them. He also said that he didn't know how he got the gun or when, but later interviews revealed that just before the family left from visiting Uncle Gator's house, Aunt Angela and Uncle Gator realized that their Smith & Wesson 9mm pistol was missing from their nightstand. Uncle Gator said that he searched the family's luggage and everywhere around the house, but he couldn't find the gun. He would go on to say that Mason was also helping them search for the gun, but now he realizes that while searching, Mason went into the bathroom for quite some time. Angelo remembers seeing Mason even bringing his bag into the bathroom during this. They said that they did search his backpack after coming out of the bathroom and they saw that there was no gun inside, but they didn't actually pat anybody down. They said that they didn't think to. Even though they seemed more quiet and reserved that weekend, Mason especially seemed fine. He was hanging out with his cousins and being his normal self. So they do regret not patting everybody down to see where the gun was, but they truly did not think that the family stole the gun. Obviously, they searched everywhere that they could. They searched through the luggage. They looked everywhere that they could think of to, you know, rule that possibility out. And they figured, you know, if it wasn't in their luggage and it wasn't in his backpack, how are they going to hide it on their person? So they just didn't think to pat them down. Obviously, now they regret not doing that. Eventually, this gun would be traced back to the gun that was used at the murder scene. But again, in the interview, Mason just kept saying that he didn't know where he got the gun. He said that he just shot each member of the family, ran down the street, and threw the gun so that the police wouldn't find it. Then he returned back to the home, got in the car, and called the police after driving to the end of the driveway. Initially, police could not find the gun, but after Mason sort of told them the story of where he discarded it, after searching more around the area, they did actually find the gun. It was discarded about a mile east of the sixth home, tossed in a ditch. As police asked more and more questions about what happened and why he killed them and how, he didn't really have a lot of answers. He said that things that night were just a blur, but he kept saying that he was fed up with everything. He eventually went on to say that his mom and dad were constantly fighting. Things weren't good at home. He said that he didn't want his siblings to grow up in that kind of environment, so he shot all of them. So, police asked Mason if he had family issues with his parents or if he was abused. At first, he told the police that he doesn't like to talk to other people about his family issues, but he said that he told some people in the past about his issues that he was facing. In the interview, Mason alleged that his father, John, was an alcoholic drug user who could be abusive at times. He said that every Friday night, John would come home drunk and pissed off. He went on to say, quote, Sometimes he would hit mama. She would tell him to stop drinking and she'd go cry in her bedroom. Then they started going to counseling, but that only lasted six months and he found every way to blame mama. I was holding Kane on the couch. She started yelling, look what you're doing to the children. As police started to get more into their investigation, they spoke with more witnesses who could corroborate some of the abuse that Mason may have been suffering. Lola, Mason's girlfriend, recalled a few times that she personally witnessed at their home. In one incident, she said that she witnessed John grabbing Mason's crotch and then pushed him down. She said that Mason begged to be let go while his father grabbed his legs and pushed him on the floor while he was laughing. In another incident, she said that John dragged Mason out of the car and struck him in the back of the legs. She said that there was yet another incident where she was over and Mason was downstairs in the basement folding laundry. He went upstairs and was gone for a few minutes, but by the time he came back down, 
he was holding a rag over his nose because his nose was bleeding. So obviously in that incident, she didn't necessarily witness him being hit in the face, but you can sort of draw your own conclusions by what she saw. She said that after witnessing all of these incidents, she was not allowed to go to their house anymore and she was honestly really uncomfortable seeing the family. Another witness came out to say that she knew Mary and John and she witnessed John mistreat Mary on more than one occasion. I don't know if this witness saw any physical abuse, but this person said that they're surprised that Mary stayed with John after seeing how he treated her. The witness said that Mary worked a lot and that John didn't. She said that John often degraded her and would make inappropriate comments towards her in front of other people, so you can only imagine what kind of comments he made towards her not in front of people, in the comfort of his own home. Mason also told the police that Mary was also always going in at him. He said that she was always on him about doing his chores and about his manners. He was fed up with how she was treating him too. Then other witnesses came forward to say that John had large amounts of drugs and alcohol in the home at any given time, and they said that Mary had removed all of the drugs from the home just before the killings. So, it seems that there may have been a lot more going on in that home behind the scenes that really did make life difficult for the family. Maybe John was abusive. Maybe Mary was allowing John to bring drugs into the home and maybe she was helping him hide it or maybe she was trying to help him stop using drugs. But they weren't alive to testify to that, so we truly don't know. But other witnesses came forward to say that Mason was also bullied a lot at school. Others came out to say that Mason acted aggressively towards his siblings, that he had control issues. Then there was another incident that police were made aware of. Some people believe that Mason tried poisoning his stepmother prior to shooting his entire family. One report described that Mason allegedly put peanut butter in Mary's coffee, knowing that she was severely allergic. She drank that coffee, and of course, she had an allergic reaction. But obviously, I don't think it was ever officially ruled that Mason truly was the one responsible and that he purposely put peanut butter in her coffee. But again, it is thought that this was a prior attempt at poisoning her. The next thing that police did in their investigation was to search Mason's cell phone records. There were several messages between Mason and Mary spanning from November of 2018 to August 24th, 2019. A lot of these messages were Mary scolding Mason for not doing the laundry or other chores. Then by August 24th, there was one final text exchanged between them. Mary wrote, Mason, please bring your phone upstairs. Then a few minutes later, she wrote again, Mason, please bring your phone upstairs. Then finally, a few minutes later, she wrote, now. It was clear to investigators that this was Mary taking Mason's phone away for one reason or another, but others say that within the text messages on this phone, there are also plenty of loving text messages text messages that show that Mary was kind towards Mason and that Mason had no ill will towards Mary besides your typical spiffs between a teenager and his mother. I don't think these texts saying, bring your phone upstairs right now, are any signs that she was abusive or that she was overbearing or controlling. Taking away a teenager's phone after they act up is very, very, very normal. But there were even more damning messages sent from Mason to his girlfriend after he was arrested. So, after Mason was arrested, he was allowed to have a chirp messenger device in jail that allowed him to send text messages for 10 cents per text. I will talk more about the reasons why in just a few minutes. But some of the text messages that Mason sent to Lola, his girlfriend, read, quote, I'm not a monster, although everyone thinks I am, and they look at me like I am. In another message, he wrote, Lola, I want to be a contract assassin, to which Lola wrote, no. Then, Mason sent another text saying, I found out what I'm good at. I killed my whole family in four seconds, all headshots. I hate feeling like I'm being dragged by evil. Then, in another text, I believe this time to another friend, he wrote, I've got a foolproof plan. I'm going to escape. I'll be on the run for the rest of my life. So clearly, based on all of this, Mason's confession that he killed his family, trying to gloat to others after being arrested, his alleged history of abuse, 
it seems that Mason did kill his family and that he had a motive to. But a cousin of John's named Daisy actually came out with even more information that can point to why Mason all of a sudden decided to kill his family when he did. This cousin said that just before the murders, that is when John actually told Mason that Mary was not his real mother. She said that it was revealed to Mason that Mary was actually his stepmother and that his biological mother had passed away. Daisy said that Mason did not take this well at all. She truly thinks that this is what triggered Mason to all of a sudden murder his entire family. So, of course, with all of this information, Mason was arrested and charged with five counts of murder for each member of his family. He was placed into solitary confinement for the time being, and that is why he was allowed to have that chirp device for communication but after being arrested, he pleaded not guilty. As he was awaiting his trial in jail, guards and others around him said that he showed absolutely no remorse. He didn't talk about his family at all. He didn't seem to care about what he did whatsoever. So, the trial for murder started in September of 2022. The prosecution talked about the body cam footage from the night of the murders where he was acting suspiciously from the jump. They talked about his confession, those text messages, and all of the other evidence that they had. The defense, however, pointed out a lot of problems with the prosecution's case and how investigators handled this case from the beginning. First, they said that Mason was only 14 years old at the time of the interrogation. They said that he wasn't read his Miranda rights until over 30 minutes into the interview. They said that Mason thought that he was under arrest and he did not understand that he was legally allowed to leave the interrogation at any time. However, the prosecution said that when Mason first went in for their interrogation, he was being questioned as a witness, not a suspect. It was only after he was considered a suspect that he was read his Miranda rights and then questioned as a suspect. Alabama law states that someone does not have to be read their Miranda rights unless they are arrested or in custody, and the prosecution argued that he was not in custody or under arrest at the initial time of the questioning. The defense said that the responding deputies considered placing him into custody since the moment they got there. They also said that he was denied his right to place a phone call after his phone was taken away from him. But as they were going through this trial, the defense actually filed a motion for a mistrial. So, throughout the entirety of this trial, they did have access to Mary's actual cell phone, like the physical cell phone, but they weren't able to actually get into the cell phone to see what was on it. The prosecution said that they had been trying to gain access the entire time, and it was only about a week before the trial that they finally had access. The defense said that there may be exculpatory evidence on the phone, because during this time, the prosecution argued that Mary and Mason had a normal, loving relationship, but the defense said that she was abusive. So, the defense argued that due to how late this phone was cracked, neither side had enough time to actually examine the phone. Because of this, the judge actually agreed and the mistrial was declared. The prosecution was disappointed, but they actually said that this is a good example of the system working. The prosecution in this case said, quote, Evidence came up whether it's for him or us. It came up Wednesday night and now this defendant has been provided an opportunity to have additional time to work on this. I would hate to have somebody we tried in a case, we get a defendant convicted and then all of a sudden they crack open a phone and there's something on that phone that would exonerate them. It's disappointing. I'm going to have to box this file up. My family is going to have to live with this case again. But the thing about it is, my number one thing, at the end of the day, every defendant in this country needs to have a fair trial. And while it is very disappointing, it's irritating as all get out, but this will ensure Mason Sisk will get a fair trial when it comes back up again. Which I do think is a very fair way of looking at it, and I'm glad the prosecution in this case at least seems fair and not just out to get a conviction to get this case done as soon as possible, like we see in some cases. The second trial for these murders started in April of this year, 2023. This trial lasted for seven days. They discussed the autopsies of each victim, which sent the jurors into tears. They discussed the alleged abuse and Mason's mental health, his confession, whether it was fair and under the right circumstances. 
they discussed the cell phone data and the relationship between Mason and his parents. In total, the prosecution had over 30 witnesses ranging from family members, friends, police who he texted while he was in jail, to the various officers and paramedics who were on the scene at the night of the murders. The defense had no witnesses to take the stand. The prosecution talked about how investigators tested Mason for gunshot residue on the night of the murder, which came back as positive. So, he was identified as being the shooter. Then, a confession expert actually took the stand to talk about the techniques that investigators used to get this confession from him. He said that the tactics they used can be coercive and that sometimes it has led to false confessions, but he thinks that in this case, the fact that Mason was able to lead investigators to where the gun was that was enough for him to believe that this confession was real and that it wasn't coerced, it wasn't under duress, it wasn't because he didn't understand what he was saying. He thinks that this was a legitimate confession. After arguments from both sides, both sides rested and the jury was sent in for deliberations. And after two hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their verdict. The jury found that Mason Sisk was guilty on four counts. The first count was the murder of two or more persons, and then the remaining three counts were charges of individual killings of persons under the age of 14. The court said that what is important to the jury is that Mason will never hurt anybody ever again. As of right now, Mason has not yet been sentenced. It has been a few months since his verdict, so I'm not sure why he hasn't been sentenced or when that will take place, but I imagine that will happen at some point soon, and as soon as we learn of his sentence, I will let you all know. But that is where the case ends right now. Obviously, this case appears to be something that happened so out of the blue. I wish we knew more about the history of the family, if there were any red flag behaviors or anything like that. Some people said that Mason at school was starting to act a little bit abnormally, that he was becoming more withdrawn, but other than that, nothing else has been reported on as much as I have been able to see. There are a lot of things that are left unclear. I still don't know how much I believe that John and or Mary were abusive. There are over 30 people who testified, but not too much was said about the abuse. Now to me, I do think it's possible and probable, especially if Mason reminded John of his ex-wife who passed away and did drugs and made his life very difficult and all of that. I could see Mason being picked on and abused by John while he treated the rest of the children just fine. I also did see during his trial that there were allegations of sexual abuse. Again, I only saw it listed in like the mitigating factors when each side comes up with their like aggravating factors or the mitigating factors to, you know, come up with the sentence. Sex abuse was one of the mitigating factors, but again, I wasn't able to find too much more information on this other than that instance of John, you know, grabbing him by the crotch and pushing him down. I don't know what other sex abuse is being alleged here. I do tend to lean towards believing Lola since she was a witness to the abuse, but again, we don't know a lot about the relationship between Lola and Mason. Was Mason abusive towards her? Was she told to say those things? I don't necessarily know. Maybe Mason told her those stories and she believed them and she told the courts as if she had seen them. I do wish we knew a little bit more. If this case feels a little bit incomplete to you, it's not just you. I literally told you every crumb of information that I can find because I feel like there was a lot left out in the reporting. I even tried to purchase the court documents, but all of the documents that I had access to were literally just like the list of charges and things like that, nothing that was really useful. But in my opinion, I do think there has to be a reason behind why a 14-year-old killed his entire family. I think that if it was just a normal kid who was being treated pretty normally by his parents, I don't think they just go and kill their family because of normal family bickering and normal issues. I just don't see it, so I do think that there was something going on here. I do think that John probably was abusive given what we know from witness statements. I think that maybe it was either on and off type of thing where Mary would forgive him, he would act better for a while, and he would then do it again. 
or it could have been ongoing and Mary just felt stuck in the relationship or maybe she just made excuses for it. We truly don't know because they are not here to defend themselves or testify to this. Obviously, I don't think that this means that all of them deserved to be murdered, but it does mean that Mason could have had some sort of motive behind this. Maybe he's just mentally unwell. We truly don't know the exact reason for why this happened and I truly hope that more information comes out as more time goes on. But either way, my heart does break for those children that were just innocent victims in all of this. They truly didn't deserve all of it and they truly didn't deserve any of it and I really, really am looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think about this case. Like, what do you think the motive was here? Do you think that Mason was just this mentally ill teenager who was angry at the world and took it out on his family? Do you think that Mason really felt that he wanted to stop his siblings from growing up in this environment? Or do you think there was abuse going on and he either wanted to stop it or get revenge for it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. But that is where the case ends today, so that is all I have for today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and check out and like my Facebook page and follow my Twitter and Instagram. All of that will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I also have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.